Feliciano. Well, welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you for uh, being part of a, a webinar, which I think is very exciting. Uh, how we become a more inviting church, how we have tools to help us invite, how we develop and create those tools in our local situations and some of the things that are available. Uh, before we begin, let's uh, uh, say this prayer for evangelization. Uh, this prayer was developed as part of Disciples in Mission many years ago, but it is uh, still a very, very powerful prayer. Loving God, you called each of us by name and gave your only Son to redeem us. In your faithfulness, you sent the Holy Spirit to complete the mission of Jesus among us. Open our hearts to Jesus. Give us the courage to speak his name to those who are close to us and the generosity to share his love with those who are far away. We pray that every person throughout the world be invited to know and love Jesus as Savior and Redeemer. May they come to know his all-surpassing love and may that love transform every element of our society. Mary, Mother of the Church, pray for us. St. Paul the Apostle, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So, we have had some fairly uh, powerful moments here in Washington, uh, the first leg of the, of the Pope's visit here in Washington, D.C., and the images and the words and the, the excitement of the Holy Father has truly been enormous, not only within the Catholic community, but beyond the Catholic community. In fact, the Holy Father today, uh, in his offhand remarks, said to people, um, if you don't believe in God or if you don't pray, still send me good wishes. So he, he is aware that there are people who have grown a little distant from their faith or maybe keep some kind of uh, residual sense of their faith. And uh, as, as an evangelizing church, we want to ask ourselves, how do we invite, how do we reach out, how do we connect? with other people. And uh, we're having this webinar in the fall. Uh, I wish we could have had it earlier, but there were too many other things to schedule. Because the fall is such a perfect time to think about invitation. So many of our ministries are getting underway. So many uh, opportunities we have to kind of get the word out, to involve people. Uh, as we know, for better or worse, much of our parish activity runs from September to May or June, in line with the, with the school year. And in the summer, um, many of us, uh, especially our families, but also our staff, are trying to get a little time away. So uh, the fall is really a, a time of tremendous uh, energy and thinking about invitation. And it's not too late to think even now about more effective ways we could be reaching out inviting and using tools for invitation because our catechumenal process is just getting underway. Many people are still involved in the inquiry phase, the phase where people are making initial contact with the message of Jesus Christ, but particularly bringing their own questions, their own searching, their own struggles into the conversation. Uh, time for youth ministry uh, because the Children have finished whatever they do in the summer. They're done with their summer jobs. Young adult ministry, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, ways that we might think about uh, young adults and reaching out to them. And then the whole religious faith formation ministry uh, to children, to teens, and uh, to adults. And we know we are trying to develop a cohesive vision of adult faith formation, which is to say ongoing discipleship, because we have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have received his spirit, and are being called more and more fully into discipleship. How does this process of discipleship be part of our own growth from children into our teen years, into our young adult years, into our adult years? So fall gives us uh, tremendous opportunities to think about invitation 
And of course, there's no reason just to limit these to the fall, but uh, just to reflect on that. Uh, and as we look at the catechumenal process, uh, the RCIA, the Rite of Christian Initiation for Adults, um, lots of times we can look at that, and, and we know this is a word you never use with the RCIA, but unfortunately, people look at this as a program. And there it is, we open the books, we do this, we do this, we do this. And uh, uh, there are several major disadvantages with looking at it as a program, especially looking at the catechumenate merely as a set of lessons that we're giving people to. Uh, we, we have to look at, uh, in our own hearts, what is it we are inviting people to? And this is where we can get in touch with the evangelical power that is woven right into our Catholic experience. And if we get in touch with that evangelical power, we begin to see maybe other ways we could frame the invitation to be involved in uh, the uh, catechumenal process. Uh, what are we inviting people to? We're not inviting them, quote, to become a Catholic, close quote, or, quote, to join a Catholic church, close quote. Those processes, becoming a Catholic, joining a Catholic church, are part of this deeper biblical, spiritual, divine activity that is our basic ministry in the church, to come to experience and to know Jesus Christ, and to know this Christ personally in our own hearts. And because I know Jesus Christ, I am being part of of his kingdom. I give myself to his kingdom of love and service, and I do that through a life of discipleship. To experience and to deepen my experience of the Holy Spirit. I'm always reminded that the founder of the Paulist Fathers, servant of God, Father Isaac Hecker, would say that the whole purpose of everything we do as a Catholic is simply to open our hearts more deeply in listening to and responding to the Holy Spirit, that is, growing in holiness. We are inviting people to be disciples, to undertake a journey that will be their life from now up until that time when they encounter God in Jesus Christ in the resurrection. We're inviting them to be part of a community, a community that deepens discipleship. Uh, certainly, uh, again, alluding to uh, the Pope's uh, visit, which he's just concluding as I'm talking here in Washington, this tremendous sense of a community of faith. Uh, you see these visions of uh, these images of the Pope surrounded by people of every nationality, of every way of life, every age, etc., and, and you begin to realize the vastness of that kingdom and how that kingdom is made real through the community that you and I are. And we, as Catholics, in a particular way, can offer people an experience of a community that is authentically worldwide, authentically Catholic, without edges or borders encompassing every human heart. We're inviting people to experience conversion or experience reconversion, because often people in our catechumenal process will be people who have come from other church traditions, and in those church traditions have already been touched by the Holy Spirit. And we are inviting people to express the conversion that they are experiencing, to express their discipleship through a new way of life and through the sacraments. So, uh, this is uh, what we are inviting people to, and um, it is an enormous gift to offer people. It is a wonderful and important gift to offer people. Uh, sometimes when uh, people become Catholic, uh, go through the catechumenal process, they're filled with tremendous enthusiasm, and you say, well, why? Because they can see the things that very often you and I take for granted. And so we need, first of all, to be aware of what it is we're inviting people to and to get in touch with our own sense 
of being involved in the mystery of Jesus Christ, our own sense of conversion, our own sense of having been called and sent by Christ. And, and, and I think this is a, a great spiritual exercise, especially for those of us who are kind of getting back after a summer into, into pastoral ministry, to do a little spiritual inventory about our own sense of relationship with Christ, our own sense of being motivated by the Spirit, and, and how this can be renewed inside of us. What is our experience of Jesus? How do I sense myself as being a disciple, a disciple who is growing every single day, a disciple who encounters God, who serves others in the name of Jesus, who is growing in daily prayer, growing through the word of God, growing through our participation in God and discipleship, growing by being a servant, a missionary servant, as the Holy Father calls us to be. Our own sense of living in the kingdom of God. I mean, so often we Catholics think, well, if I put up with this life and suffer enough, then maybe I'll get into the kingdom. Where the truth is that, if we are living our Catholic life, we are already experiencing the kingdom. That's what discipleship is all about. And so how do, how do we get this sense of being a kingdom person? That is living in that realm where God is at the center of our lives, bringing transformation to our relationships with God and our relationships with all human beings. Uh, the Pope is such an excellent example of what it means to be a kingdom person. With our own growth in faith through the Holy Spirit and with our own connection to and need for a community of faith. So uh, these are, are ways that we can kind of ask ourselves, what am I experiencing? Because this is exactly what I am trying to give in the catechumenal process, in the RCIA. And, of course, people are going to come at that experience from many different angles depending on their own life experiences. And they're going to experience and articulate conversion in a variety of ways, and we need to give people the freedom to do that. But we also need to get in touch with our own sense of being in the kingdom of God because we are Catholics, because we're members of the church, and the excitement of drawing other people. Uh, Jesus saying to Peter, I'm going to make you fisher, fishers of people. Go out and catch people in my name. And so... Um, that's, that's kind of a little uh, preamble to the catechumenal process. And, and, and I think we need to think big about the catechumenal process. Uh, we need to think of the catechumenal process not only as liturgy, which, of course, it obviously is, but also as invitation, also as outreach, also as that net that Christ throws into the sea to try and gather women and men into his life, into himself. And so um, here are some ideas to, uh, to kind of think about our catechumenal process. Of course, letters, and in this day and age, uh, not only letters, but electronic letters that we can send to parishioners with material that they might share with others. And I'll show you some of that material. Um, uh, some people in our office, in fact, a person sitting right here, uh, Emily, who helps host this thing before she joined us, was working for Chick-fil-A. And Emily said to me, when we were uh, interviewing her, she says to me, you know, every Chick-fil-A, every store, has two people marketing, getting the message out, thinking of ways to appeal to people. And, and I have that in the back of my head all the time. If Chick-fil-A can do that with chicken, what about us Catholics and Jesus Christ? I mean, come on, let's, let's get into this. So um, what, how can we communicate with our parishioners? Because they are in touch with people who are asking religious questions of them. They are in touch with people who are hungry and who are searching. How do we give them little tools and, 
and resources? Uh, how do we develop flyers about the inquiry process? Something that is more than, would you like to join the RCIA, which means hardly anything even to active Catholics, let alone to people who may be searching. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in my next transparency. Our external signage, ways in which we say, come and encounter Jesus Christ, come discover who Christ is, ways in which we, we say what the catechumenal process is, be part of God's kingdom, be part of God's love. Uh, and maybe develop some nights, and you know, this is maybe outside of, of some of our uh, ways we do the, the catechumenal process, but there's no reason why we cannot invent very dynamic and very uh, enticing inquiry nights, come and see nights, come and search, come and share. Anybody can come. Just uh, put that message out. Um, you know, we're in our churches and we're in our rectories, we're in our convents, and uh, we think everybody knows about us. Meanwhile, people are walking by or driving by our church or in connection with the members of our church, and they don't know anything about what our church stands for in, in, in any kind of And they certainly don't know this personal relationship with Jesus Christ that we can put into this wonderful Catholic tradition, our, our, our broad Catholic tradition to sustain that experience. Develop images of Catholics living their faith. Try and get people into the sense, I'm not taking classes so I can learn enough to receive the sacraments. But I am becoming part of a people who are on the vanguard of the kingdom of God, bringing the kingdom into our world. Uh, we have a, a, a resource here I'll talk about a little bit later called uh, Neighbors Reaching Neighbors. And part of this resource are a set of brochures, and uh, there are different kinds of them. Uh, you can flip them on the other side and put labels on for your parish. Develop your own brochures. You can see some of the titles that we have here. Um, we don't have all the answers. We don't have a silver bullet here at Paulist Evangelization Ministries. If you have something that's going to work in your area, but attractive, positive, dynamic ways in which people get a sense and a positive sense of who we are. Little tiny notice in the bulletin just is not going to do it. Little church lingo like join the RCIA is not going to do it. How do we become an inviting church and develop the tools for doing that? We also have developed here these little tiny booklets. They're maybe two inches by an inch and a half, and we model them after a certain organization that attacks the Catholic Church all the time and distributes these through prisons or what have you. Well, we don't attack anybody. We have very, very positive images in which we are bringing about provoking questions for people to get them thinking. Well, what do I think about judgment? Do I have problems? Maybe I already have the answer. It's a short path to begin thinking about faith. Or the big question, do I dare to ask it? And these are, again, little booklets, very inexpensive. You put your label on the back. Give them to your people to give to other people. Hand them around where people can pick them up. If you're in the process of doing uh, recruiting, say, on a college campus, these are wonderful little things to put there during rush week or uh, other, other kinds of, of, of things that are happening on, on the college campus. Um, the same way if your parish is having a festival or some other kind of thing or part of a neighborhood festival, set up a little table. Get your name out. Get images out there that begin to talk about our Catholic Church and what we have to offer people. I am, I am so amazed at how blah and lifeless, lifeless our own energy is when it comes to inviting other people to the most important thing they can have in their life, their relationship with God, as that is initiated grown and sustained within our Catholic tradition. 
um, how about some snazzy posters in the parish? Uh, and, uh, you know, I've given some language here, but this is only to get your own imagination going. Do you really think you know Jesus Christ? Many times we allude to Jesus. We may even pray in some genuine way, but have we discovered Jesus? Has he touched our lives? Have we met Jesus in his fullness, depth, and personal power to transform our lives? If these questions intrigue you, come to our parish on such and such. And then invent a process to help people experience this. In the inquiry process, in the catechumenal process, we are asking people to come to a discovery of Jesus Christ and a discovery of Christ's community as that is lived within our Catholic Church. So let's put our imaginations on. Let's let's invent the tools Let's think about processes. Let's see how we can generate a little energy around this. Now, I'm going to play a little video from something that we have developed here at Paulist Evangelization Ministries. It's part of Neighbors Reaching Neighbors. It can also be uh, purchased separately. But it's, it's our attempt. I'm only playing part of this video, and we hope it works electronically. Um, uh, I'm playing this to give you an idea of the kinds of positive images of Catholic people. You know, what did the Pope say uh, to the bishops the other day? Um, Love is more important than dogma. Uh, They have to see the love. They have to see us. They have to see us as a community. So let me make sure that I can get this thing going. I think I hit this little button, and let's see what happens. Thank you for participating with us. We really appreciate your interest. Hello, I'm David Bauman, and I'd like to introduce you to more than a billion people. Don't worry, this isn't an attempt at social networking. This is about a different kind of connection, one that's more than 2,000 years old, a spiritual community called the Catholic Church. Now, when you think of the Catholic Church, you probably think of famous sites, or rosaries, or nuns. Yes, those are notable, but the Catholic Church is more than rosaries, or bishops, or St. Peter's in Rome, or even St. Patrick's in New York. Today, I would like to introduce you to the real Catholic Church, the people. The Catholic Church is the people, spanning the world, forming one living sacrifice of praise, just as the prophets hoped for, as St. Paul preached, and even as the book of Revelation dreamed. The Catholic people coming together, coming together around the globe, each in their own community, each in their own parish. Hi, I'm Katie Akame. I'd like to talk to you about the Catholic parish, home for millions of Catholics who worship and celebrate the mass every week. Some parishes may be grand edifices, but many are much simpler buildings. Yet a parish is not a building, no matter how magnificent or humble. Every parish is fundamentally just the people who make up the community. Uh, Why do I love my parish? I think the the short answer is uh, maybe a one word answer and that is the people. I just really like the sense of community that we have here. My parish is a very welcoming community. I love the fact that it is a parish that embraces all people, all diversities. Uh, We are a very service-oriented parish. It brings uh, people of all different walks of life. We have the students, we have people who work downtown, we have people who live in the suburbs, people who live in the urban part of town. Uh, And that brings a vibrancy to the parish, I think. I think the support that you get spiritually from everybody else is amazing. I know if I'm ever struggling with a spiritual problem, there's so many people that I can come and talk to, whether it's a priest or an extraordinary minister or 
minister, anybody here, I could just talk to them. What do Catholics find in their parishes? A community of prayer, a diverse community that calls everyone to the deepest relationship with God. Every parish has a pastor. Pastor is just another word for shepherd because being a pastor is not about being the guy in charge. Just the opposite. It's about service, about giving one's life for the spiritual enrichment of others. Being a pastor allows me the opportunity and the honor to celebrate faith with the people of God, celebrating the sacraments, baptism, the mass, weddings and funerals are a wonderful opportunity for me to really get into the lives of the people whom I serve. Being a pastor of a parish or an associate pastor has people coming through the doors all the time wondering about how they might improve their walk with Christ. And it's a privilege to be able to give them insights or information or inspiration to be able to help them to deepen their relationship. And the great side effect of that. So is that's that a little sample of a life. video that uh, we have available. Uh, it'd be great to play this even for our Catholic people so they get a kind of a positive sense of, of who we are. We have these wonderful images of Catholicism because the Pope comes, but how often does a Pope come here? Let's get images of Catholicism that, that are positive, showing us in our ordinary, everyday Catholic life what a beautiful, wonderful, varied, deep, spiritual people we are. Even with all of our flaws and all of our limitations, we see those all too clearly, but we have so much to offer people. Let's get those images out there because people are hungry and they're searching and they're looking. Now let's look at youth ministry here. And uh, um, this is a, a very important component. As we know, we read statistics all the time. And, and we know these years of youth ministry, uh, particularly after grade school, are enormously critical because children are developing their sense of religious identity throughout the teen years and also into their young adult years. This is a much more complex process than it used to be. But part of that process is exactly these years when uh, young people are trying to discover who they are, are, are trying to get a sense of themselves, and are making all of these decisions about the important pieces of their life. And one of those pieces, we clearly want to be their faith. So we already have existing contacts in the parish. We know who graduated grade school. We know former CCD teachers. We know local youth leaders, et cetera. So have your youth minister design material so that youth can invite other youth to ministry happenings. You know, it isn't something... Uh, th this do doesn't work primarily by adults inviting youth. The most powerful uh, dynamic is always peer-to-peer. -peer. How do we develop material so that our young people can be inviting other young people to participate? What, what, what are the young people getting in terms of their contact with the church? And when we have strong youth ministry, and every parish need strong youth ministry, when we have that, the young people are getting an enormous amount out of that. And, and this is something that, that is not only helping them, but they're proud to share with other people. And explore with your youth minister and your young people what are the social media components, because the people are living through their cell phones these days through their tablets, so what is the Facebook, the Twitter, the Instagram, the Pinterest, and whatever they're going to invent next week. What, what, what are these um, apps, what are these resources that they're using to stay in touch? Because that's how young people are creating a virtual identity. Who's on their, uh, their Facebook page, who they tweet with, et cetera, et cetera. And emphasize diverse elements in the youth program because our, our youth program, uh, which is responding to people who are growing up, shouldn't be, here's another lesson from the catechism or here's another lesson about this or that sacrament. But you've got to have a, a variety of components, uh, social gatherings, community service, growth in faith, uh, growth in faith that has both spiritual practice and catechetical information, we're going to point you to a resource that uh, has a, a lot about youth ministry, uh, which will be available for you 
free of charge. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, as we get near, near the end of this. So uh, get with your youth ministers and try and develop a campaign to reach young people and get in touch with them. Young adult ministry. Young adults are the most important group to reach because you can take charts of who's involved in church and the older people are, like me, the more consistently they are involved in church. And the younger people are, in, in, like in their 20s and their 30s, the less consistently involved they are in church. And sometimes we make a mistake, a kind of a category mistake, if you will, by assuming if people are not involved in church, then somehow they're not involved with faith or religion, which is not true. There's a lot of religious activity. I mean, look at who's showing up for these papal masses and things. It's, it's in our gut. We're just not in touch with these. So um, how do we reach this important but very difficult group? And anyone who does this ministry will say that young adults, especially young professionals, are running here and they're running there and they're out of town and they're going over for this kind of work or they're going to the beach or what have you. So you're working with percentages and you need a group large enough so that if a third of them are away at any particular time, the group can sustain itself. Now, a lot of parishes have built upon this theology on tap experience. I know when we were in Chicago, we would often have 60 or 70 young adults come for the theology on tap. Maybe they wanted the tap more than they wanted the theology, but at least they came. And the Renew International, uh, you can Google them, is now uh, providing this. But uh, if we do theology on tap, what's the follow-up? How do we get people from these experiences that they may have more intensely during the summer or particular into something that's more regular in their lives? And that's invitation, knowing who they are, getting to connect uh, with them as much as possible. And again, emphasize spiritual searching, social gathering, service to others, things that young adults like to do. And uh, uh, there is uh, uh, some research saying that you know young adults sometimes are mostly drawn when they are able to be of service to others and service to those in need. And um, the emphasis of our church in terms of being a church of missionary disciples, humble people who go out and connect, especially with the least, is a very, very attractive uh, component in young adult invitation. So maybe our outreach for young adult ministry might be some kind of social action dimension, some kind of dinner we're going to put on for the homeless or some kind of way we're going to go over to um, the central food pantry and help sort food or some uh, 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 place where people go homeless in the evening and we go once a week, whatever that is. Um, link young adults with others in the diocese where they might uh, most likely cluster. There are sometimes parishes in the downtowns on Sunday evening where young adults just kind of tend to be and uh, link your young adults with those kinds of groups to build up the resources as much as possible. Uh, again, we cannot be inviting this group enough. This is an important group to have involved in church, and it's a particularly important group as people progress through young adulthood into marriage and into commitments and into having families. Faith formation. And here we're talking about the whole gamut of faith formation, not just uh, CCD or PRE or whatever we might call it in our parishes. Um, we have children and youth and adults to reach out to. When it comes to children, challenge yourself to reach children you don't usually reach. And um, uh, uh, this is so important, I, uh, one diocese that we're in contact with believes that there are like 80,000 children who call themselves Catholic, who are not regularly involved in religious education or in the parish. And some of these might be language issues. 
children are moving in that maybe don't speak your language or the parents don't speak the language that you're most comfortable with, well, stretch yourself. Go to census.gov, type in your zip code, and look at the numbers of young people that are in your parish. Build upon summer experiences such as vocation, Bible school, and often uh, VBS or uh, various kinds of, of summer programs will attract children who are not regularly part of the parish experience. They'll be friends and neighbors, and mommy and daddy doesn't know what to do with the kids, so go over to St. Mary's over there and be part of their program. Well, these are people we can reach out to and invite them to be part of our ongoing religious experience. Uh, have a children's neighborhood event, some kind of party, some kind of game night or fun night or what have you, and advertise it broadly just to reach beyond the usual families that you see. There, there are so many children out there who uh, don't know about parish, don't know about church, never felt a, a connection, and yet maybe they go to public school with some of the children in our own parish. Public uh, uh, advertisements should be broad and clear, put them around, especially if we're going to do some events for children. Uh, some parishes that I worked back uh, uh, a ways with, uh, like at Christmas time, we would do a neighborhood Christmas party. And we had gifts for any kid who came. And we would just get the word out, and there'd be two or 300 kids that would come. And it was so good to see them come together, see them relate to our regular children, and have the opportunity to invite these families to come back again as the Spirit was drawing them. Email the parents, text the parents, Facebook the parents, whatever your electronic connection is, because parents are likely to be using that. Ask them to think about neighbors who have children who are not connected and how these children can be connected to your parish. Um, little neighborhood party. Come to our before school neighborhood party. All neighborhood children are welcome, prizes and games. You have fun just thinking about this thing and get a group of your parents together, and they'll have fun putting this thing on and, and just uh, be outreachy and get, get your name known in that neighborhood, and uh, you'll see results in terms of the lives that you'll be able to touch, lives that would have otherwise been missed. Faith formation for adults. Now, if uh, any of your parishes said, well, let's... Um, uh, help our people understand evangelization. Let's uh, invite Father Frank DeCiano to come in and talk to our parishioners. Well, if you did that, and you're certainly welcome to do that, you would have, what, 20, 25, 30 of your regular faces that would show up because that's what happens when we think of faith formation as classes of information that we give to adults. What I'm suggesting is that we diversify our offerings as much as possible, given the limitations and the resources of our parish staff. Small groups, occasional classes, meetings for parents and for young adults, ecumenical interfaith events, material you have in your weekly bulletin, links on your website. There are all kinds of ways that we could be getting the idea that we as Catholics are always growing in faith. We are always disciples. We, there's always ways in which we need to open our hearts more deeply to the drawing of the Holy Spirit, plumb God's word more fully in our lives. So think about all the different ways that adults might interact. And, uh, you know, part of this is think about ways that families might interact because uh, one of the key things we're noticing, and uh, I'm sure the meeting up in Philadelphia on the family will bring this about, our families need to be more explicit as families in the acknowledgement and the celebration and the living of their faith lives. Make sure everybody's invited. Go beyond your usual parish methods generate materials that parishioners can share with others, make a splash around these things, and give people a nice little menu that they can pick and choose 
so that they can uh, uh, grow in faith. Um, here's a little, maybe some words for a neighborhood poster we might put out. There's a spot for everyone. We have many different ways to grow in our faith. Choose the one that works for you. Then give them your menu, etc. Join us in any program that will enrich your life at such and such a church, and then put down your uh, website or your contact, your email, or what have you, your phone number, so that people get a sense that this is something everybody wants to be involved in and there's something for everybody to do. And again, you know, this uh, challenges uh, the imaginations of our parishes. Let's have a staff meeting where we invite people to put on their brainstorming caps and try and imagine adult faith formation in a different way. Think about how you can extend a wider invitation for every ministry you're doing in your parish. Think of electronic and paper methods that get the, work, the word out. Use the social contacts of your parish and families to reach people you don't usually reach. Create videos. Use existing videos. So we've had, as part of our webinars, um, very creative pastors who have people in the parish make and edit and put on videos that kind of uh, splash things up. Father Ralph Somer up in um, uh, Long Island is an example of somebody who is really uh, creative in doing this. Uh, coming soon, uh, we're going to have this little uh, booklet uh, called Becoming an Inviting Church. Uh, we're having uh, the thing laid out, and these are a series of short articles that we've put together as part of our evangelization exchange, and there's a link to the uh, kind of draft of this, so you'll be able to uh, download that, just go up to links, et cetera, and, and download that, and, and use it as, as a, a discussion tool for your parish staff. Uh, we really got, you know, we got to open our imaginations and, and think of new ways to do things. So, um, and uh, our parish staffs, I mean, uh, beyond our parish staff, our pastoral councils and our youth councils, et cetera, all can be ways in which we all get to talk about how to reach out, how to extend an invitation. For example, you may have a fairly active social justice component in your parish. And maybe they are regularly involved with uh, a homeless kitchen or a, a food pantry or some other kind of organization. Many of these things happen ecumenically. Advertise that. Get the word out. Come help us feed the hungry. Come help us make a home for the homeless. Get that out beyond your parish people so that that kind of energy, that kind of invitation can draw people and they can begin to experience how we Catholics are committed that way. So uh, this uh, Becoming an Inviting Church is uh, uh, available uh, as a PDF, and in it there are all kinds of different ways to think about inviting our parishioners, families, young adults, seekers, and active Catholics, Latinos, a great section on youth, um, it actually co it comes in, in, in three, uh, three sections right there, and seniors. And uh, there's a, um, a concluding essay, which uh, I, I worked, was happy to work on that one. What are we inviting them to? And so often we say that with a kind of, well, it's just poor little sorry us, rather than realizing the wonderful resources that virtually every Catholic parish has or can easily have that be wonderful things to invite people to. So um, those are some of the ideas that we wanted to put out in terms of tools for invitation. You can see all these question marks over here, which means now it is your opportunity to either ask a question or maybe share things that you do with other people who are part of this, maybe share a little bit uh, of some of the invitation that you do. So I'm going to pause to give your uh, fingers a little time to travel over the keys, and I'm going to ask Emily if we've gotten any questions so far. We do. We have one so far, and actually a second just came in. Uh, the first one is, I understand the importance of young people doing community service, 
but they don't have to be Catholic to do that since other religious groups reach out as well. How do we catechize this age group? Right. Uh, you catechize the age group by uh, when they are, uh, first of all, you never take away somebody else's faith. So if somebody is involved in another church and they're serving and the Holy Spirit is working in their life, the ecumenical movement, which we have been committed to explicitly for over 50 years, says we build upon the faith that that other person has. It's not our job to take Methodists and dismantle their faith so that they can be Catholic, nor is it their job to dismantle Catholicism so they can be Baptist or, or some other kind of thing. But I think as people are involved in the social action, even, even in an ecumenical way, they can find out about and be invited to uh, the parish, various activities in the parish, especially things we might do at particular kind, uh, uh, times of year, like Thanksgiving is often an opportunity to have a very creative ecumenical ways to go. So again, it's an invitation. We catechize people because somehow they've caught part of the gospel. They want to know more about that part of the gospel. And when we offer it to them, that's what we call catechesis. Hope that helps. We had another question. Miss Emily? Um, we're waiting for another one. So We're waiting for another one. <laughs> All righty. I thought that, that we, uh, we had more of them coming in. So let's just wait here a little bit. Oh, oops, I pushed too many, excuse me here. So um, we have a, a webinar sale here, and uh, we have this resource called Neighbors Reaching Neighbors, and it's a whole set of uh, examples of things that you can use to reach out. There's a, a very short but very informative manual that goes with that, and it kind of gives parish, different parish settings, whether they're urban or whether they're old suburban or bigger, newer suburban or what have you, ways in which we can use material. Then we give you all these samples of different material. And, um, you know, you can use those samples to develop your own, or you can um, uh, order that material from us at a, a very, uh, very reasonable price, uh, very attractively done. Also, as part of Neighbors Reaching Neighbors, is that DVD, you saw a little bit of it, um, an introduction to the Catholic people, which I think is exactly the kind of thing that we need to be offering. So, so often we, look, we think of the Catholic Church as catechism with mass thrown on top. And it is so much more than that. There's so much relationship and so much humanity and, and so much dynamism in our parishes. So um, that DVD comes with, uh, in the Neighbors Reaching Neighbors kit. And uh, there's another DVD uh, which gives examples of Catholics witnessing about their faith, how Catholics talk about their faith as a, as a way to help us get a little more versatile in our own stories of faith. If you want that DVD by itself without the kit, although I don't know why you would, but if you do, that DVD is available by itself at a discount of fifty ninety five. dollars um, But get the kit as well because it gives you so much more, and both of them are at discount uh, uh, for this sale. And how long is the discount going to go, uh, Emily? Oh, uh, up till uh, October 5th. So... Let's, um, uh, let's think about developing resources for our parishes. Um, then um, we're going to have another webinar called Reaching Inactive Catholics, and this is a way to relook at some classic themes, looking at new research, and also to talk about what awakening faith can offer to our parishes. We have some questions? Yeah, I yes. have one question. Um, our feast day is coming up. What can we do to be inviting our neighbors who may stop by for the fun activities? Okay. What can you do to, oh, first of all, invite them. If you're having a feast, get your parishioners to, I, mean, I, I like the idea of developing uh, little messages using uh, your word processing material for postcards and put four on a sheet, cut them up, 
make a, a thousand of them or so and have them out in the pews and tell people, take two or three of these and stick them under your neighbor's door, or you can do the same thing with flyers. If you have a, a neighborhood where uh, you have parishioners with stores or friendly store merchant people, you can make a nice attractive flyer and put those things there. If you have a supermarket that has a bulletin board, um, sometimes just putting something, I've seen parishes put something by the bulletin board and, you know, four or five people say, oh, I was shopping at such and such and I saw your advertisement. And, and, and so uh, really be creative about getting the word out about the feast. And if you're doing that, put up a booth, an information temp, uh, a table where you have little free giveaways about your parish and information about your parish and ways for people to get on email lists or ways for people to leave their cards or whatever it is so that you can be in contact with them. Um, uh, parishes, uh, they get these catalogs all the time, you know, by... Uh, 500 pens for $25 or something like that. So, think, you know, kind of think creatively about stuff. Now, I noticed uh, for many years we would be involved in the Ninth Avenue Festival in New York, which uh, goes along Ninth Avenue, the west side of Manhattan, and it virtually starts at 57th Street, two blocks from our church in New York, and it goes all the way down to 34th or something like that. I mean, there's like... A, two million people there every day and the focus is food and um, it's very hard to put religious material in people's hands when they're thinking about eating so you might have to add a little eating component or some kind of thing like that so that when people are coming by they get they get to know who you are the important thing of course isn't the the item that we do it's the face contact that happens because of the brochure, the pamphlet, the item, et cetera. That's not where it happens. It's in the face contact that that object permits. So uh, do your feast up big. Don't just invite your parishioners. Invite everybody in the town. Uh, get that whole zip code covered so that they know. And speaking of zip code, I'd add one other thing. Um, Facebook offers zip code specified advertising. So you could go in and create a Facebook ad and you could specify that it would only show to people who live in the zip codes that you're trying to target. And so you could have, you know, a little bit about St. Mary's Parish, the date, and then say fun, free activities for the whole family. And that way when people are on their Facebook, they'd see that. I know we all are used to seeing those ads where, like, you go shopping and that ad follows you around for three days later. You could have that but for your parish. So that's one other way to kind of get, you know, your word out there if you're looking for something a little bit more, especially if you live in a dense urban area. That would probably be a great way for you to target young adults. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, we in New York, we used to uh, each year have what we called an auction. This might have been a little euphemistic because people would basically empty out their closets with all kinds of stuff they would otherwise throw out. But they would bring it over to the church, and there'd be old cameras and lamps and blah, blah. And we'd make these posters. We'd put them all over Ninth Avenue, all over the 50s, et cetera, all the way up to the 70s. And they'd be big, colorful posters. Ah, we, we must have had 500 people come. And then we'd get an auctioneer and blah, blah. And he, most of these people were people we never saw. And, you know, here's, uh, here's some statue that, uh, you, you know, was some Greek something or other. And the auctioneer would be there saying, who will give me? But this is collectible item, he'd say. Who? And he'd get everybody excited. And people just had a great time. But it's a way of creating buzz, an example of, of how we create buzz. Uh, Emily, if somebody did that Facebook thing, what, what, what did they charge? Would you know that? Yeah, it's, so Facebook usually charges, um, you can kind of set it up two ways. You can do by click or by the whole campaign. So, for instance, if we ever boost anything on our f Facebook page, I usually put about $5 in. And that's enough for me to get... 300 to 500 people for most items, which for $5 is a pretty efficient way of spending it. You're usually looking at about 9 to like 16 cents per click. And so those clicks are anyone who's like, oh, I want to learn more. And so a great idea is if you have a parish website, you could have a, you'd have a page on that parish website about the event. Or if you don't have a parish website, which hopefully you do, but if you don't, you can always create a Facebook event, and that way people just go directly to the event, and they could even RSVP for the event, 
That way they'll get reminded by Facebook, hey, don't forget, Parish Picnic coming up today. And so that's one way to connect with people in a way that's not just in the real world, but kind of online where a lot of people do spend a lot of their time and do kind of, you know, I know I have like 16 Facebook invites where it's like, yeah, sure, why not? And then when the day comes, like, oh, good, I'm so glad this is here. I would have forgotten it otherwise. So it's a low commitment way for people to find out more about your parish and maybe just maybe be like, oh, let's check it out. We've got some free time. So, And it's super easy to share, too. So people who are in your parish, you can invite them to, like, their, your own pay, like Facebook page, and they can share the event on their Facebook page for their friends as well. So that way, can I get a little bit of, vi you know, a little vileness going on. <laughs> All right, so, you know, $5, that's uh, not a lot of money. So parishes often feel, oh, what can we do? This is all almost impossible. No, uh, electronics has made a lot of things very accessible today and uh, helps us uh, uh, really make a splash. So we're about ready to end this uh, webinar. We have one more question. Yeah, I got one last question for oh, we good. go. Oh, good. Um, this one is about weddings in specific. Oh. Our questioner says, I think it'd be a great... <laughs> I think it'd be great to make a big fuss any time a parish celebrates a wedding. With all the focus, with the Pope being here on marriage and the family, I think we could do more to highlight it. Maybe our parishes could do a feature on the couples getting married or something along those lines. So she just wanted to share that as an idea for parishes and see if you had any thoughts on how we could highlight weddings and make that more of a way to open yeah. up our parishes to people. Yeah, no, I think it, it might it might be possible, uh, given all the videographers that uh, happen to hang around weddings, to uh, ask uh, couples to maybe share some clips from their wedding events. And then you make a, a nice little 10-minute video about uh, weddings, the celebration, etc. cetera. And uh, if you do that, you can have uh, two or three purposes with it. One uh, purpose would be to show it to couples as they come to get married to give them ideas, although uh, I will say as a clergy person, brides usually come with very particular ideas of how they want the wedding to go. But I think it's, uh, it's a way to share what other people have done and, and, and just some of that. And then when we have uh, uh, events like we're celebrating anniversaries or celebrating um, uh, uh, the Holy Family or something, to show that video uh, when people come to church as a, a way in which family life begins and, and is celebrated in our parishes. So, uh, I, and this can be done uh, in a variety of ways. Video now makes things very possible for people that would have seemed almost impossible just 10 years ago. Yeah, and I think it'd be great, too, if you're making a video, you can ask each couple, you know, if you have a couple come in, why did you want to get married in the church? You know, what made you true to the mm -hmm. church versus the beach destination mm -hmm. wedding? And even if you don't necessarily make a video for all these things, if you have a Facebook page or on your parish website, you could share these reflections or even put it in the bulletin for at least your own parishioners. Like, oh, wow, you know, it's nice to see, like, these young couples mm -hmm. who are coming here and getting married. Yeah, and, and you can bet if couples are coming to a parish to get married today, there is some real clear, distinct real, religious reality going on in their lives because the alternative is just so widespread of, you know, what was it, a beach destination? Beach destination. Beach destination wedding. Uh, I've gotten... Rustic Country Club. <laughs> yes, invitations. Why don't I fly to Jamaica, say, for a wedding or something? Well, if I had the time, maybe. But um, so if they're coming to church, there's something that's drawing them to religious expression. So maybe that can be captured in some way, and you know, it's not difficult to make a video today. So, uh, thank you so much for participating. We uh, did record this, and uh, the link will be made available to you. And what I would invite you to do, and you get the link, is to share it with other people so that there is a little afterlife. Um, I, I think it's very hard for us to think about inviting and welcoming with the energy that we should. And I hope that this webinar is maybe a contribution to get us all a little stirred up with, uh, with the great sense that we have that we can spread the word well beyond ourselves. And then October 8th, um, I'll be back from a uh, um, fairly complicated trek, but I'll be uh, very happy to uh, join you once again in reaching inactive Catholics and, and talking about uh, our resources and approaches for doing that. Uh, for now, let's also pray that the Holy Father's ministry 
continues effectively, as powerfully, and uh, surely as safely as it has so far, and that he becomes the, uh, the image of the kind of apostle that all of us are called to be in Christ Jesus. Thank you so much. God bless you. It's my end. <laughs>